Um, we will move on to the uh, next panel on uh, culture, art history, communications, and education. Um, uh, and we'll have two panelists. Uh, and uh, oh, it's working now. Um, and by way of introduction, my name is Cécile Fromont. I uh, teach in the History of Art Department uh, here at Yale University. And uh, uh, let me uh, add my welcome to uh, my colleagues um, this morning. Our um, first uh, uh, pan panelist is uh, Professor David Plank. Uh, who is a research professor at Stanford University in the School of Education, as well as the executive director of policy analysis for California Education, PACE. Thank you, Cecile. And I'd like to add my thanks uh, to Yale University and to the Ministry of Education for the invitation to participate in what really has been a really excellent conference. Um, I should add uh, that actually I'm the former executive director of policy analysis for California education. I retired in March, um, but I am still co-director of the Lemon Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation in Brazilian Education. And so now my almost full-time responsibility at Stanford is on Brazil. So, um, and, uh, and I've been a Brazilianist for 40 years. I just took a detour into California. And, Thought that was interesting for a while, but now I'm back with Brazil. So, uh, um, before I begin, I, I, would, I just want to ask a, a sort of silly question. But are, are, how many of you are familiar with Harry Potter? Can you just okay? So it's it's known in Brazil and it's known here, because I've been struck. Um, in, well, in Harry Potter, there's a very important character, a, a dark wizard, uh, who is known to most of the characters in the book as he who shall not be named. And I have a sense in this meeting um, and in some recent other meetings about Brazil that there is a character looming over us uh, who shall not be named. Um, and I may say that <laughs> name in the course of my presentation, which no one has done so far in this conference. And I just wanted to make sure that there is no one who is going to drop dead on the spot if he is named. So, so be forewarned. If, if, that's, if that's true for you, then you should probably leave now. Um, uh, Cecile didn't read our prompt question, so I will. Uh, in thinking about research in Brazilian culture and education from the perspective of the American Academy, how important are these fields of research in the United States? What is their place in the Academy at present? And what is the importance to the Academy of their contribution to Brazil? Have you seen any changes in these perspectives? Well, this turns out not to be a simple question. And, and I think Joe and I talked about it a little bit before the meeting, and we weren't quite sure what we were supposed to do. So my decision was to. Uh, try three different times. I'm going to talk about the road ahead for the field of education in Brazil and, and Brazilian studies in the US. I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, the road ahead for Stanford, um, where we do a lot of work on Brazilian education. And then if I have time, and Cecile has told me she'll, she'll cut me off when the time runs out, but if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about the road ahead for Brazil. Um, and. Uh, so I'll say one more thing by way of introduction, um, which is that education schools are like Noah's Ark um, in that we tend to have two sociologists and two philosophers and two English teachers and two of, two of this and two of that. And so each of us comes to the field with a very partial perspective. I know some, some parts of the field very well and other parts of the field uh, not very well at all. So, so I will, uh, uh, my presentation today will reflect those, uh, those limitations on my part. Um, so, so Brazil has actually had a huge impact um, on the field of education uh, in the United States. And the reason for that is that, that the, the dominant line of work uh, in Brazilian education faculties and among many US scholars uh, who are interested in Brazil has focused on critical theory and the, implications, uh, the implication of the education system in, strict, in structures of domination and oppression. And the guiding spirit for this work is Paulo Freire, um, you know, the, the Brazilian educator, uh, who has in fact been recognized by the Brazilian Congress as the patron of Brazilian education. Um, and this, this, is, this, is, this is for better and, and for worse um, in, in, this, in the field of education, I think primarily in Brazil, but also in the United States. Um, for better in the sense that Freire has inspired um, a number of action researchers 
in, um, in education in both countries uh, who have engaged in deep work uh, trying to change the ways in which teachers teach and children learn, uh, inspired by Freire's example. Um, but he has also, uh, or the, the sort of Freirean tradition has also fostered, um, particularly I would say in Brazil, a general posture of critique um, and a, um, well, critique as a substitute for engagement. Um, and since I never say bad things about my colleagues, I will quote Simon Schwartzman, my friend from, from Brazil, who says that as Brazilian education professors see it, society is unfair, people are exploited, governments do not care about the teachers or about education, and not much can be done before a real and deep social transformation or revolution takes place. And so, you know, there, there's, there's, I think, you know, particularly in Brazilian education faculties among some of my colleagues in the U.S., um, there is a sort of infinite production of rhetoric about how bad uh, the education system is, how it betrays children, how it betrays teachers, uh, but no real effort to change it. And that's, that's distressing to those of us who are, have been engaged in the challenge of changing Brazilian education for a long time. Um, okay. So uh, Freire's in influence is, is, is extremely powerful in the U.S. as well as in Brazil. Uh, uh, there is a Freire Institute at uh, UCLA, um, which uh, partners with a Freire Institute, uh, a nonprofit Freire Institute in Sao Paulo. Uh, there are Freire and disciples and education faculties across the, U the United States. And even in the Lemon Center where I work, um, last year was the 25th anniversary of Freire's death, and we published a, a memorial volume about Freire's contributions to education, uh, primarily in Brazil, but also in the US and around the world. Um, as, as we look to the road ahead, it's safe to say that this line of research is going to carry on uh, for the next few years, uh, probably with renewed energy, uh, both in Brazil and the US. And now my warning takes effect. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, everybody still, still alive? OK, all right, good, OK. <laughs> Uh, Jair Bolsonaro has threatened to take a flamethrower to the Ministry of Education and to get Freire out of there. Um, and, uh, you know, this makes an oppositional stance, the kind of oppositional stance that Freire uh, embodied and advocated, uh, suddenly much more urgent for many of us. Um, that if, if that's the agenda, then resisting that agenda is, is a powerful motive for, for many people in my field. Um, and, uh, but the, the threats and the challenges that Brazilian and possibly North American researchers will face under the new government are quite real, I think. Uh, the second major line of work uh, in, uh, in Brazil uh, resides mainly, uh, but not entirely, outside the, the faculties of education. Um, it often is conducted in the economics departments. And over the years, much of this work has been carried out under the auspices of technical agencies of uh, the Brazilian government, including uh, IPEA and INEPI, um, often with the support or in direct cooperation with international agencies, including the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank. Um, and this, this, this body of work has focused, which I've been involved in, so, so you may take my comments both on the previous line of work and this line of work with that as, as a caveat. Um, has focused very, very, very closely on policy evaluation and policy design. And over the past uh, 20 years, uh, there have been huge, um, from my point of view, improvements, uh, huge changes uh, in uh, the Brazilian school finance system, uh, in the operation of teacher labor markets and in the preparation of teachers, uh, in the development of standards and curriculum, uh, in, the design, in the design and implementation of large-scale assessment systems, and in parenthesis, I would say Brazil has been a pioneer, a global pioneer, uh, in the development of assessment systems, not only for basic education, but for universities as well. Um, and the, the work has been concerned with how, how these policies and uh, uh, policy changes have affected the performance of schools and students. Okay. And this line of work will also continue. It, it has produced good social science. Not only has it produced improvements, I think, in Brazilian education, but it has produced good social science 
um, that has been published in international journals um, and uh, you know has affected uh, policy conversations in the U.S. and other countries um, because Brazil has done done interesting and innovative work uh, in the field of education. Um, you know, just taking a couple of steps back in anticipation of, of some steps forward later. Um, the, Cardozo, the Cardozo government was a high point uh, for economists and technocrats, um, uh, friends of mine, um, uh, and uh, you know, developed, sort of the, set, laid the foundation uh, for new and more equitable finance policies, uh, dramatically higher standards and salaries for teachers, uh, introduced the, the Bolsa Familia, um, which has made, brought, brought, brought about major changes in Brazil. Uh, and began the work in assessment and evaluation. And the PT governments um, built on the foundation that was laid down by uh, their predecessors in the Cardozo government with some Frarian twists. So they, they accelerated the expansion and, and increased equality, uh, mainly th with, through the instrument of the Bolsa Familia, which, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, conditions assistance to families on their enrolling their children in school and keeping them keeping them in school and making sure that they attend. Um, so and so under Lula, Brazil finally uh, achieved the virtual universe, universalization of basic education. Um, uh, there were large increases in secondary education, secondary enrollments, and in higher education as well. Uh, the the Lula government introduced affirmative action. Uh, in Brazilian universities, uh, which has been uh, a subject of great interest and curiosity, not just to Brazilian scholars, but to North American scholars as well. Is, how is this working? Since we have effectively abandoned affirmative action, what can we learn from Brazil about how this works and what we can do in our universities? Uh, the acknowledgement of racial and gender differences and inequities in the curriculum and in classroom practice and the, it began the process of developing uh, the Base Nacional Curricular Comum, uh, and the, if, well, no, that was not Lula, <laughs> but uh, but the new standards for for basic education. Um, and these these changes have generated a large and growing body of scholarship, both in Brazil and in the U.S. Um, as I said, there's widespread interest in much of the PT's agenda, including affirmative action innovative curricula and Frarian pedagogy in, for example, the schools that are run by the Movimento Centeja, um, where, you know, which were permitted, were allowed, and in, in some respects encouraged uh, under the PT governments. Um, and there's simultaneous interest among economists and policy scholars in the Bolsa Familia, uh, in the rapid and basically uncontrolled expansion of, of private higher education in Brazil. Uh, and now in the Base Nacional Curricula Comum. One of the questions we were asked is, is what, what has changed over time? And, uh, and I think our colleagues in law uh, talked about this yesterday, and uh, it's certainly true in other disciplines as well, that when I began working in Brazil 40 years ago, there was some deference, I think, some sort of unearned uh, credibility um, for North American scholars in Brazil. Um, and that has gone away, um, probably as they've gotten to know us better, but also uh, um, as uh, the um, Brazilian academic community in education, as in other disciplines, has been greatly strengthened. Um, so uh, we now see a lot of close cooperation between Brazilian scholars and their North American con uh, counterparts, both in the sort of, in the Frarian tradition, as they sort of exchange ideas about how to. Uh, how to resist the state, um, but also among economists and uh, um, others working on public policy. Okay, so that's my first answer uh, to the to the prompt that was that was posed. Um, the second answer, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the the Lemon Center at Stanford University and uh, the work that we're doing on Brazilian education. The center was founded uh, eight years ago, uh, and again, things happen sometimes sort of by accident. Um, for faculty members in a small faculty, the Faculty of Education at Stanford is about 45 people, uh, and it turned out that four of us uh, spoke Portuguese and had extensive experience in Brazil. So I had begun my career as a Brazilianist. Uh, Martin Carnoy um, has worked on in countries around the world, but has spent considerable time in Brazil and speaks Portuguese. 
Uh, Paulo Blickstein is a scholar of science education and education technology and is himself Brazilian. And Eric Bettinger uh, um, was a Mormon missionary in Sao Paulo and so learned to speak Portuguese, had never worked on Brazil, but was fully equipped to work on Brazil and has since become uh, uh, quite engaged in scholarship on Brazilian education. And we've been joined over the years by uh, visiting professors, including uh, Hebeka Tarlo and Catherine Muller, uh, both of whom who uh, have done excellent work on education in Brazil. So uh, the, the, the mission of the uh, Lemon Center is to support uh, improvement in the performance of the Brazilian education system uh, by conducting research and engaging in project work uh, that uh, seeks new strategies for educating young Brazilians. And so we've worked closely with Brazilian co uh, colleagues on a variety of projects aimed at supporting innovation and improvement. Um, we have uh, brought more than 150 students and visiting fellows uh, to Stanford for extended periods of time over the past eight years to advance their own research, but also to partner with us on projects uh, within the center. Um, we have strong programs of research in uh, the economics of education, in pedagogy, uh, and uh, educational technology, along with individual projects in other disciplines. Um, we have, well, we, we put together, we, we uh, organized a meeting for uh, Brazilianists, a subset of Brazilianists. Okay, I, I was afraid of this. Okay, yeah. I, I told you, you have to give me a warning, because once I get going, I, I, it's hard to stop. Um, okay, so in any case, uh, our, the bibliography of publications from the center is about six pages long now and growing. So um, we are engaged in multiple projects, uh, a project called PEGI, the Programa de Especialização Docente, uh, which, is, uh, which has established partnerships with eight universities, three public and five private, and also with the Municipio of Salvador Bahia to change the ways in which uh, teachers are trained in Brazil, which is a major failure of the Brazilian public universities and uh, really one of the great obstacles to bringing about improvement in Brazilian education. Uh, we've just established a new center uh, in Brasilia called uh, Dados para um Debate Democrático em Educação, d 3 um, The key leaders of that uh, project are Tassio de Sousa Cruz, who uh, works for the Fundação Fundação Getúlio Vargas in uh, Brasilia, and Mauricio Holanda, who was the Secretary of Education in Ceará. Uh, we're work in, uh, through D3A, we're working with other policy organizations, including CEIPI at uh, the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio, and we're hoping to work with uh, our colleague Daniel Vargas uh, in the center that he's establishing on federalism and education in Brazil. Um, I and others have been working on the, imp the challenges of implementing the Base Nacional and now the uh, Reforma do Ensino Médio, which have both been approved by the Conselho Nacional de Educação, but you know, remain very much on paper. Um, the, the, the process of bringing them to Brazilian schools and classrooms is just beginning. Uh, we have a project in Sobral, in Ceará, uh, to develop new science, new, new, both new materials and new techniques for science education. Um, and my colleague Eric Bettinger has been working on a project on what economists call nudges, um, small changes in uh, the environments of students and parents that lead, what we hope, lead to uh, big changes either in their behavior or in their mindsets. Um, the center, the Lemon Center, has established partnerships with multiple states and federal agencies to share data um, and conduct analyses of how different policies and institutional arrangements affect student learning. So at the center, we uh, house data from the states of Sao Paulo, Pernambuco, and Ceará. Uh, we have da data sharing agreements with MECI, uh, INEPI, and Sometimes you pay, it pays a little, little more complicated. Um, so, how many minutes have elapsed now? Okay, two, two left. Okay, uh, so I, I will, I will simply say that that many of my colleagues uh, over the past two days have talked about this as a liminal moment uh, in Brazil, or a fork in the road, or a turning point. Um, and I think, as I don't see him here, but as uh, Professor Carlos Ivan Simonsen suggested yesterday. I think we're about to see a resurgence of some old debates, uh, Brazilian debates about education in a contemporary context. Um, and uh, you know, th these fundamentally have to do with whether the new government will continue or reverse changes that have been made by Brazil's recent governments. Uh, 
uh, including the professionalization of teaching, affirmative action in university admissions, and uh, curriculum reform. Uh, the, the, the third one of these is of particular interest to me uh, because the question of who owns the curriculum has a long history in Brazil. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a 15-year standoff in the Congress over questions um, that were basically, that focused on the Catholic doctrine of subsidiarity that asserted that uh, education was the responsibility of parents and the church and the state should not be involved. Um, and the principle of liberdade do ensino, which, which persists, which basically argued that, that education was a private affair and the state should only intervene if private agencies failed to provide education for children. Um, in our contemporary uh, context, uh, the, the place of the Catholics in these debates has been taken by the evangelicals. Um, but the arguments remain very much the same. Uh, you know, that uh, um, who decides about the curriculum? Should it be parents and pastors? Um, and there's a new, new actor in these debates, which is uh, organized teachers. Uh, who, a, a, a colleague of mine uh, came back from Brazil, he'd just been conducting some interviews and he told me that a teacher that he interviewed said, well, all curriculum is fascist. You know, that, that you know, teachers should have complete autonomy in the classroom. This is a sort of Frarian notion that, that the classroom is a, is a discourse space in which teachers interact uh, with students and that curriculum is fascist. So, so, and then we have the Basi Nacional Comum, which is the state asserting its right to tell you know, all teachers and all students what it is exactly that teach students should learn at different grade levels. Um, so the, the question of, of how this moves forward under, under the new government, I think, is uh, um, an open question and I think a, a portentous question. Uh, for Brazil, uh, you know, whether the government will allow implementation to continue or whether they will discover that the new standards are fatally infected by Karl Marx and Paulo Freire or whether they'll decide that they were written in dialetto secreto. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the further set of questions uh, has to do with what the implementation of Bolsonaro's own priorities will look like in practice. Um, at, on the campaign trail, he had two explicit priorities, what he called educação sem partido, which meant basically that teachers should not ever talk about politics in their classrooms, but only talk about uh, useful information, whatever that means. Um, and uh, this has manifested you know, since the election in attacks on universities and individual teachers and on the national readiness exam in uh, for including an item focused on the uh, dialeto secreto. Um, and the second priority that uh, Bolsonaro articulated was uh, banning discussion of sexuality and gender in Brazilian schools on the argument that such topics should be the exclusive domain of parents. And, you know, he, he has not taken office yet, so it's unclear how this will play out. As I said to a Brazilian colleague this morning, our experience in the United States suggests that when people say things on the campaign trail, they mean them, and that things are likely to be, if anything, worse rather than better after he takes office. But there are a lot of pending issues in education and a lot of anxiety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, control. All right. Perfect. Um, our next panelist uh, is Professor Josef Strabhar. Um, the Amon J. Carter Centennial Professor of Communication from the University of Texas at Austin. All right, thank you. And I, I will join the, right, and you'll, so that I can see. You'll give me warnings at 15 and yes. so forth. Okay, I'll do the, okay, thanks. All right, I figured at this point in the day everybody would probably benefit from having slides, so <laughs> bear with me. And we've talked about that. So what I wanted to do, my interpretation of the, uh, of the charge to us was to think about where Brazil has been an important case or example in both the US and international debates about media and communication study. And interestingly enough, it has. In fact, on the first point, I mean, I didn't emerge from college as a would-be Brazilianist. You know, I think maybe I, it sounds like some people do. But what happened to me was I got to graduate school and got in, I was doing international relations with an emphasis on media. And in fact, became a diplomat for eight years, which is what my grad school, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, really wanted me to do. It also seemed like a great way to get to Brazil and do a PhD on Brazil. But 
I did that in part because in my coursework, I'd gotten very interested in who were going to be the big emerging media powers in the world that were going to challenge what then seemed like American dominance. The prevailing theories in the early 70s when I was studying all this was very much about cultural imperialism. And so I'm going to concentrate a bit on that because I think in many ways, in my discipline at least, Brazil's biggest impact in the world has probably been being used by me and several others as a, as a very direct challenge to that, you know, emerging finally in Brazil, being seen as a brick, an emerging power, which we haven't really talked about. Maybe that's seen as a dead issue by people, but in, and I have a very lively debate going with several international political economy colleagues who say, well, China dwarfs everybody else. And I usually say back, Brazil is actually more important communication power than China. And I think it is. And so uh, I want to talk about that as much as anything, I think, today. But here's kind of a menu of what I, and I'm not going to talk equally about all of this, but I think it's interesting. Brazil is a very valuable object of study also in how a variety of, of uh, elements, government, private industry, et cetera, have helped construct a national identity in which TV particularly became very powerful in the construction of national identities. When people look at that globally, in the US and in other countries, Brazil also emerges as a pretty interesting, fairly powerful case. I do want, definitely want to talk about that a bit. It's definitely an example of hybridity. I think that's probably been talked about. I love to start my classes by saying that the Brazilians invented hybridity theory with anthropophagia cultural and love to kind of show them, you know, examples of that as a way of getting them to think seriously about the idea. And so it's been a very crucial case in a variety of things. I think starting in some ways with development arguments, certainly with the arguments about cultural imperialism, and even now I think both in globalization writ large and in various specific things, like the election of he who shall not be named, which had, was greatly impacted by WhatsApp, which simply a year or two ago I began to research because I was very excited personally by a, co a technological extension that gave poor Brazilians with only a feature phone, not even a smartphone, a way to communicate with each other. And it's still very exciting, but as we've discovered in our election with social media, you know, it's very powerful for good and bad, you know, and particularly WhatsApp compared to Facebook is essentially invisible. It's encrypted to a level that people have no idea what's being passed around. As we discovered in the very last minute discovery of uh, a number of powerful economic groups contributing to the election of he who shall, shall not be named, by sending things around the world, around Brazil on WhatsApp. And I said, so I think Brazil is very, I mean, when the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, Guardian, have headlines about how WhatsApp just helped elect your president, in some ways in a way even more visibly powerful than what happened with Trump and Facebook, then we've got an interesting thing to study. And in some ways, it's always a, a discussion of and when people get discussing the state and media, Brazil's always an example. And I think Brazil's also, as is with this, with this WhatsApp case, very much an, exam, an uh, innovator in new media. So in many ways, we do have this very strong discussion, which is still very much in play, about how Brazil, compared to other countries, used first things like sport, samba, but Radio Nacional, very, very specifically, to help construct a national identity, and then how a C. Chateaubriand with Tupi kind of in some ways doubled down on that, but also frankly failed. Cases of failure are just as interesting as cases of success, and nobody remembers that TV Tupi probably should have been the Televisa of Brazil, but was so disastrously badly managed that it fell apart. Um, and so Brazil's an interesting case both for success and failure in some ways. One of the big issues when we look at the interaction of U.S. and Brazil in this field of media and communication study is that many people, particularly political economists, tend to see the U.S. as essentially imposing its format and its, its patterns on Brazil. And in fact, for much of the time, I got there first in 1976, and a couple of years later, one of my friends, a woman named Ana Maria Fadul at USP, said, Estamos sofrendo a maldição adorniana, Adorno's curse, that people were so 
preoccupied, even blinded by political economy and the perception of enormous unchangeable power in the hands of Globo, that A, they didn't understand how it had been put together in detail, and B, didn't really realize that there were a lot of transformative things going on at going on with it that you had to step outside of political economy to understand. But still, I'm in constant debates. Like just last year, somebody said, all right, you're the expert on telenovela. So if, telenovela, if, if we're still just having soap operas selling soap, what does it matter that it's made in Brazil? And so I had to sort of pick myself up off the floor and say, really? You, 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 you don't think that cultural content matters, that it's only whether it sells soap or not? So that's my basic, when we reduce my discussions with political economy, sometimes it comes down to that, really. You don't understand that the content matters. Um, and so it's, it's interesting. That's still a very large preoccupation. And in fact, invisible things have happened. Like this is an example by a friend of mine at USP and now uh, Instituto Metodista, who's looked at the ex how Brazil ex adapted the idea of the anchor man. And there's plenty of examples. Perhaps the biggest one, let's skip here for a second, is the famous telenovela. Brazilians get very angry if you say, well, you know, there is a genealogy that goes from Colgate Palmolive through Cuba, where the telenovela was created, down to Brazil. And people, you know, so there's very robust argumentation about that. But I think in some ways it's an interesting example where you can see overt American influence, literally Colgate Palmolive, prompted the creation of the telenovela. People from Cuba fled Castro and came to Brazil to help propagate the telenovela. I mean, one of the great unintended consequences of history is that Fidel probably didn't realize that while, while eliminating commercial culture in Cuba, he doubled down on it in the rest of Latin America by exiling all these really talented professionals to all these other countries. Um, that then was a process where, say, the, the main write, novella writer for Globo for a couple of years basically never wrote about Brazil because she didn't think it, Brazil is not a romantic country, so I can't write about it. So she was exiled by about 1970, finally, and they began to realize that writing about Brazil itself and creating a, a new form of television entertainment for Brazil based on the telenovela, based on the Cuban telenovela, was actually a pretty interesting idea. And something that's preoccupied me, so I, I tend to work both contemporarily, WhatsApp and Bolsonaro, as well as historically, and I'm still riveted by why it was that the, the Brazilian dictatorship in 1970 let a guy whose other main alternative that year was to become a, midi, a member of the committee, of cent, of the Central Committee of the Cuban, or the Brazilian Communist Party, Diaz Gomes, they let him become head of telenovela production for TV Globo. And the TV Globo, who was supposedly in bed with the military government, wanted him. And so we'll come back to that little mystery in a moment. But it is, you do see moments of heavy US impact. So here's Assis Chateaubriand initiating TV Tupi with RCA and invisible influence, and apparently, supposedly, had big, a big uh, extravaganza for the first day, but hadn't thought about what comes next. So apparently, both he and his technicians said to RC, the RCA technicians the next day, well, what do we do now? And uh, so there was quite a bit of influence, but I think the interesting story in the longer run is how that inf influence gets transformed. So, and Tupi, in many ways, is, is a, a really interesting organization. A lot of my information, I, I've done a lot of reading, but I've also done about 25 hours of in-depth personal history with a guy named Joe Wallach, who was the Time Life delegate who helped start TV Global and stayed on as their financial manager for another 15 years in the initial violation of the Brazilian Constitution, although he became a citizen so he could stay on. And it's interesting how something can seem powerful but as Wallach said in the interview, but it was, TV, 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 TV should have been able to knock Globo out, but it was the worst run TV in the world. So there's an interesting point there, which is in some ways the story, uh, part of the story of the 20th century with media in Brazil is going between extreme decentralization, which TV 2P had. All 24 of their condominos, their local regional owners, had equal power. So they never ran the same program at the same time which makes 
modern advertising, among other things, impossible. And so they, it was interesting, very innovative in many ways. But the thing that, one reason I wanted to go to Brazil is I was expecting a complete perfect example of cultural imperialism because Time Life had helped start TV Global and had been there up until at least 1970, if not later. And so here's Joe Wallach getting the, oh, I forget the name of the order. It's the, ma the, the main order that a non-Brazilian can get, the Ordem do Rio Branco. Cruzeiro do Sul. So they essentially have a knighthood in Brazil and uh, for his contributions to Brazilian culture. Although most of my colleagues in media studies saw him as the devil incarnate for having helped uh, commercialize Brazilian TV. So, it's an, and it's, so this was kind of essentially what I went to study and it's still hugely controversial. A lot of people look at this instance and assume that Brazilian TV is now condemned to some sort of perpetual servitude bef before the US model and also to a kind of um, damnation for being commercial. And this is an interesting point. There's still a lingering thought that all commercial media are by, by their very nature globalized, capitalist, and not to be trusted. And so this, I found this very, very strong in Brazil when I first got there. And I've had this long dialogue with lots of Brazilian colleagues about this because in some ways they're not right. They're not wrong. I mean. Time Life probably did help consolidate commercial TV in Brazil, probably did help nail down consumer capitalism in Brazil. So it had a hugely powerful effect, and it had precisely the effect that the government wanted. If you look at the military planning documents from the um, Superior, Escola Superior de Guerra, they had a very specific role for TV in mind, and it was exactly this role. And so if it hadn't, it turned out not to be TV Tupi, but it turned out to be TV Global, a vision of turning Brazil into a consumer capitalist society so that Brazilians would never even want to have a leftist revolution afterwards. That was the, the goal, to make people happy with consumer society. And so it's an interesting question. If that, that probably does almost a priori constitute cultural imperialism. But what it doesn't do is tell you about all the interesting cultural development that then took place. And so I think you can make a really interesting argument that, that particularly TV, it's one reason why Brazilian TV gets studied in the world. It's a very powerful case in a number of the big, big issues, including now how TV Global will cope with Netflix, which is something I'm currently studying. So in some ways, if you think about the, the TV, Time Life TV Global example, Time Life, in theoretical terms, had a, it had all the things, things it thought it knew and wanted to localize. Marinho had some things he wanted. He wanted to essentially localize what Time Life had to offer. And I, frankly, I would say it was 99% the latter, the way it played out. In fact, I actually interviewed the international head of, of, of Time Life at the time for my dissertation. He says, you know, we were completely ripped off by the Brazilians. They borrowed all our technology, stole one of our best guys, uh, got a... Got a interest-free loan for six years and kicked us out exactly when we were becoming profitable. The Brazilian government discovered in 1970 that, yes, this really does violate the Constitution, and we really should kick these guys out right about now. And so it's, uh, it's a really interesting case of who's got what power. You would think that something like Time Life would be enormously powerful in the world, but not in Brazil. And uh, when I teach globally, I would use the comparison of what happened to Rupert Murdoch when he went to China, which wasn't pretty from Murdoch's point of view. Very powerful actor in the world. China completely controlled him. And so, you know, it's an interesting way to teach about globalization in some ways, using strong cases like this. So one of the guys I'm currently working on is this guy, Diaz Gomez, who had the choice between being hit in the Communist Party's Central Committee, but there were two Communist Parties, and he was in the one that was more about gradual education over time and less about the one, less revolutionary in the sense. So what he wanted to do was Teatro Popular, popular theater, and was very good at it, had done some very famous plays, and a, one of my favorite films from the Cinema Novo, Pagador de Promessas, which is a fantastic film. And the military ostensibly seemed to be terrified of this guy because they let him, they wouldn't let any of his plays be performed. But TV Global gave him an interesting chance to essentially write novellas. And I, I, loved, I love his reaction. That 
é o teatro popular dos sonhos. You know, this is the thing I always dreamed of, having a popular theater for millions of people on TV. And so I think this is the other side. So in some ways, um, TV helped bring Brazil into the modern capitalist system, but it also offered a bunch of leftist playwrights their chance to talk about their vision of Brazil in the context of modernization under the military, interestingly enough. And I think, you know, trying to summarize all that, Roberto Marinho got everything he could possibly have wanted because these guys made him a lot of money. The military decided that they were going to suffer a few slings and arrows, but that they were going to get a capitalist modernity that they very much wanted, and that, on the other hand, these guys, despite having to accept nailing down consumer society, they kind of felt that we had to have the bourgeois revolution first anyway. So let's cooperate, let's make it work, and then let's push education via popular theater. All right, so two last things to think about. One is that Brazil's been very innovative in using technology, particularly for alternative media. One of my personal favorites is Video in the Villages, which is still going, favela media like Viva Favela in Rio, and just even the continued use of folk media like Cordell. It's, that shot is from a year ago. I went to one of the big uh, Foho centers. I'm doing a side project on Foho. And uh, it's interesting how central the, the imagery of Cordell still is, and that Foho itself is the basis for regional identity in some ways. Brazil is also very, a very innovative, innovative example. They are perhaps the biggest adherents, enthusiasts, of social media in the entire world. Perhaps you could argue, and I don't want to be essentialist, but Brazilians are very social. And this is maybe not a surprise that they took to things like Orkut, Facebook, and now WhatsApp very easily, quickly, and avidly. So the WhatsApp case is, is problematic and interesting because it was really only on the last few weeks of the campaign that the investigation by Folha de Sao Paulo and some others discovered that an enormous amount of fake news was being circulated really off the radar via WhatsApp. And that it probably, you hate to think, say things like decisive, but this is one of those cases where I don't like to be a technological determinist or use strong language like this, but this seems to have been very, very, very powerful. Because um, Bolsonaro didn't have much access to conventional media. He didn't have many minutes in the, in the, in the horario gratuito. He didn't have much access to TV. But he, had, he, he and the businessmen backing him played this very, very, very well. All right, one last thought, which is about interaction. And so um, one of the things I think as I've been lucky with, I discovered Brazilian Communications Academia at about the same time that they were founding a national association called Intercom, based in Sao Paulo, and I got, sort of got baked into the genesis of it. So I've been there, Pat Gringo, for a long, long time to the point where they actually have now created a Colégio dos Brasilianistas. And I was the, prim I was the, 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 prim the first, first inductee. But it's interesting, because I've had this dialogue with them for over 40 years about the role of the outside observer. And it's interesting, I think, at least in media study, they've come to decide that the role of the outside observer is actually pretty positive, as long as we're kindly disposed toward them and not going there to sort of use some horrible acts to make Brazil look bad. You know, as long as we show our kind of good faith, they're very interested to know what the outsiders think. And it's um, to the point where it's literally been institutionalized with an academy of Brazilian of Brazilianists that now has like 30 people in it. And so, uh, it, and we have a, a every two years colloquium comparing communication study between the two countries linked to their big national association. So maybe it's just been in my field, but we've been very fortunate, I think, in some ways to have a very active relationship and a lot of dialogue back and forth, and seemingly a kind of non, oh, nobody's been particularly worried about playing power politics. We know more than you do. You can't study this because it's ours. That so far hasn't happened too much. And for that, I'm very thankful. So anyway, thank you, and I appreciate your intention. Thank you very much for uh, two uh, thought-provoking um, presentations. Um, listen, I'm an academic in front of a microphone, so I will, uh, before opening, <laughs> before opening uh, the floor to question, I feel 
compelled or uh, to uh, share a, a few thoughts, um, maybe to round up the panel uh, on the topic of art history that was also uh, mentioned in the title. So I will do this very quickly because lunch is calling us. Um, but I want to mention four points. Um, the first one is to uh, uh, echo uh, much of what was said in the pr uh, preceding panel uh, on history about um, the um, issues of translation of works uh, for teaching and uh, research, language training, uh, study abroad, and gateway courses um, that are crucial to forming the next generation of uh, Brazilianists in the US. Um, uh, but in terms of language training, I just want to um, you know, have an optimistic stand <laughs> in that we're uh, in a country that has a huge uh, minority of native or heritage Spanish speakers, which basically means um, they are one semester of Spanish, uh, Portuguese for Spanish speakers, uh, away from being proficient in Portuguese, so there is tremendous uh, potential there. The um, second point is to talk specifically to art history uh, as a field in the US, uh, Brazilian art history, and then uh, art history in general in Brazil, which are both relatively uh, small fields, in particular in comparison to adjacent uh, disciplines such as uh, anthropology uh, or history. Um, and so there is much um, uh, uh, solidarity, I think, uh, between art historians in Brazil and Brazilianist art historians in the US uh, in uh, our um, desire to grow uh, the fields uh, together uh, for many reasons, and there has been a range of initiative um, by the Getty uh, Foundation, for example, to grow um, uh, together. Um, the third point is also specific to art history that has to do with uh, uh, the excellent uh, mention of uh, digitization and um, uh, the um, uh, making ways of uh, uh, having uh, archives and patrimony accessible, um, but in uh, for art history and uh, material culture and immaterial culture, uh, digitization is simply not enough. Uh, we can't download uh, um, the works of art, and that's when cultural cooperation, as educational cooperation, uh, uh, would be key uh, in terms of. Um, support for museum programming, traveling exhibitions. Um, and in the US, for example, I think the last huge uh, Brazilian blockbuster exhibition of art was probably the Brazil Body and Soul in 2001. So kind of a redux version of the Mostra do Redescobrimento um, that was at the Guggenheim. Um, and uh, museum and the art scene in Brazil is really uh, one of the most exciting in the world, and that is uh, one of the ways in which um, uh, we can think of collaboration. And uh, the fourth point uh, uh, has to do with um, uh, diversity and inclusion in the field of Brazilian studies. Um, and uh, as we all know, there are many Brazils, and I think one way to grow the field is really to uh, foster the study of the many faces. Uh, uh, of Brazil, so um, uh, uh, to be optimistic uh, again, you know, I really see that working together um, at uh, fostering the creation and the growth of new archive, new collection, new approaches is really a way forward to get uh, more students uh, and more future Brazilians excited about the field uh, in the US and uh, innovation and creativity uh, are the gateways there to a richer but also uh, a, bigger, a bigger field. Um, so thank you for, uh, uh, for your patience, and um, I would like to open the floor to questions to our panelists. Um, in the back. So my question is for Joseph. Um, so in thinking of communications, the road ahead, um, what do you see the role of academics, if any, in trying to mitigate all this wave of fake news that brings a lot of harm, not just in deciding elections, but for example, in public health as well, which is the field that I work. Is there anything that can be done? It really is a good question. And for, I wish I could be a little bit more optimistic because um, for better or worse, I mean, what's happened mostly been notable in Brazil over the last four or five years because judges kept trying to seize records of conversations between drug traffickers, and it was never possible. I mean, WhatsApp would simply be shut down before they would turn over. 
uh, any records of any transaction or, con or, or, or communication. So part of it depends a little bit on what Facebook, the owner of WhatsApp, decides to do. Do they want to cooperate with research and investigation? I mean, Facebook is finally in the U.S. opening up to research about Facebook, in part as, frankly, as part of a PR effort to show that they're doing something. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues is looking at the Russian Facebook case with evidence provided by Facebook. And so there's some potential for Facebook deciding that it has to do something and opening it up. But on, I think this is one where the technology is so far in front of the ability to study or regulate that it's, I'm not terribly optimistic. I mean, to some degree, probably the bigger, longer term answer would that people have to, or there needs to be kind of a media literacy campaign aimed at people who were brand new to all of this because, frankly, one of the problems in Brazil is that you had suddenly tens of millions of people with this new capacity on a very simple phone to forward things, get things, etc. And they were not really prepared for it in any way. They hadn't had experience with the internet. They hadn't had the experience of sort of growing up historically with the internet and learning that not everything on the internet is true. And, that, and so tens of millions of people suddenly were getting these things that because their uncle sent it to them, they just kind of assumed it would be true. And their uncle probably didn't know that it came from a businessman who was working on behalf of Bolsonaro, if you trace it back, you know, 20 iterations. And so it'll be interesting, because as we discovered with Trump, here there's no real interest in investigating somebody's technological intervention that got you elected. You know, Trump has very little interest in helping with understanding the Russia question. I don't think that Bolsonaro is going to be very wildly excited about helping understand how WhatsApp helped him get elected. That would be dumbstruck <laughs> if, if there were to be much in, if there were to be much intervention or even study, say, by the new Brazilian government. But I think so. I think this question. I think there needs to be a focus on media literacy for the, all these new users of this technology that don't know, for instance, to be skeptical. I'm not trying to be condescending. I mean, it's a thing, it's a process people go through when there's a new technology that you're just beginning to use and something, a fairly powerful intervention and manipulation gets done with that technology. I'm not blaming the people who were impressed by this stuff or, or even maybe decided to move their vote because of this stuff. But one of the longer term solutions will be that. And again, with a government that's not likely to be interested It'll have to come from civil society and other actors, I think. Okay. I, I have a question re really for, for both presenters, which is about our understanding of what literacy does. Mm -hmm. uh, if, for me, it, it, it would uh, what you just said would not explain why the highest support for Bolsonaro was among the college educated. 68%. And uh, in the past 15 years, there was an enormous increase in simple literacy, you know, less analfabetismo, and an enormous increase also in functional literacy, as defined by the statistical agency that keeps uh, surveying it, from maybe 10% of the population functionally literate, able to deal with two paragraphs and compare two paragraphs to more than 30% of the population functionally literate. So what has been, I mean, I, I really, this is a real question for me. What is the impact on a society, on a, on a culture, of such an enormous leap in functional literacy? Uh, hmm. You want to start with that one? That's more, no, much not too really. up, <laughs> When I was in graduate school, uh, you know, much, a, a much bigger share of the world's population was illiterate than literate, and that's changed over over my time my time in the profession. Um, so, what we talked about back, you know, now forty years ago was well, literacy, may, the capacity to write things down and to recover them, you know, changes the way people think about the world. It, it sort of establishes a base of facts that can be shared, that can be. Uh, hearken back to that can po provide points of reference for 
current problems. Um, I think what we certainly didn't reckon with was the proliferation, I mean, I'm old now, the proliferation of, of sources of information um, that, that not everything that was written down was true. That, that, that this is also, literacy is also a, a vehicle for communicating a lot of things that are so, socially harmful, if not personally harmful. And so I think that uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I guess, I, I mean, it's a silly thing to say, but you know, it, it, that literacy turns out not to be sort of earth changing or human changing, but simply another tool in the, in the box that humans use. And that it, it, the, the optimism that I began with when I started this work, you know, has sort of certainly been uh, qualified um, by the fact that, that simply making people literate does not make them either more uh, civic-minded or more historically aware or more um, politically astute, um, but gives them another tool which they can use for good and bad purposes. Yeah, one of the things that is engaged with the idea of technological literacy or media literacy is essentially teaching people to be skeptical of sources that you need to verify sources, that you need to be not immediately trusting, and which is a hard thing, actually. That's not how people are inclined to think, I think. And, but still, I mean, I think that premise gives us a, a tool to work with, that we have to essentially work to help people understand the need to be skeptical about things that come at them electronically, whether it's the internet, conventional social media, or something new like WhatsApp. I have a, a, a colleague at Stanford, uh, Sam Weinstein, who's a uh, professor of history education. And this is his main preoccupation now, is how do we uh, give students multiple sources, multiple sources of information, uh, historical documents, and help them sort out what's reliably sort of true from those multiple sources. And it's a huge challenge, because you know, even teachers are not adept in technological literacy or in evaluating different sources of information. If we want to be very artful, we could say we have to teach them to be postmodern. You know, to not assume that that which is in a very classic modern way transmitted to you by seemingly new and interesting sources is in fact the truth. You know, we have to, they have, we have to help them become skeptical of that. Um, one quick comment. Oh. Is this? Yeah. One quick comment on that last. I think that there are some people who would actually say that part of the problem in media consumption is that your average consumer is already postmodern and doesn't trust anything coming from anywhere, which is a kind of parallel um, uh, question. But mm -hmm. the question I wanted to ask is actually um, perhaps more directed to David Plank, and it has to do with the capitalist logic of education and the impact that that is likely to have in the educational reforms in the upcoming government. I mean, I think one of, one of the small news items that I've followed with most interest is the degree to which various members of the new cabinet um, have financial interests in both distance learning and in uh, the privatization in one way or another of Brazilian educational systems all the way from you know, early primary grades through university education and the way that that also converges in, in many respects with the agenda of evangelical powerhouses in Brazil. And so I wondered a little bit what you would have to say about that, about what is likely, um, what is likely to be the impact of that convergence and how people in the field of education are thinking about that from the US. Yeah, I think it's likely to be very powerful. Um, and you know, Brazil, relative to most other countries, has a very large private sector in education now, and particularly in higher education. Um, and that, partly because of the policies of the new government, partly because of the Amende Constitucional, which limits public expenditure, that's, that's certain to increase, right? Is that the, 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 the participation of private actors in the education system will increase over the next, certainly the next, well, either over the next mandato or over the next 20 years, right? So, so, so that will happen. And yes, and, but then that's compounded by the fact that the backers of Bolsonaro are, include many people who are deeply involved in the provision of private education and constituencies who are deeply hostile 
to the state's role in education, you know, seeing the state as a, as a, as a front for um, uh, leftists, I mean, you know, and, and, and unions and so on. Uh, so, so you know, we can, we can see this playing out in the United States, right? Is is the, the the same thing is happening? That basically what what we're doing is dismantling the regulatory framework that might rein in private actors in uh, the education system, and providing incentives, you know, partly as a consequence of deregulation, partly directly uh, to private actors to get more deeply involved in the system. And I think that's 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 what we're going to see in Brazil as well. And I, I would own, I would just you know, influenced by the previous panel, I would just say that th this has a history. This is not new. That this 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 happened in the 60s and 70s, and you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, and will happen again, but but louder. Hmm. So uh, I just wanted to pick up on the previous question about uh, functional literacy. So, you know, I think much of this is, and I think one can make the point, this has been the failure of curriculum, particularly in the first and second and third grades in, in Brazil. And, you know, with the, the problem of, of the, la or the, the failure of general understanding, which is critical for, for, for literacy and, and, and particularly functional literacy. This is a problem also, of course, throughout America, and including the United States. How much of the scholarship, and it does seem that there's not a lot of interchange between the U.S. and Brazil on that specific, specific point. Is there, what, what needs to be done, and what can be, what can be, um, uh, what needs to be done, particularly in this change of administration? Now, I bring this up because four years ago, you know, the, there was a delegation from the Ministry of Education, uh, right when, in the beginning of the Jilma, uh, uh, what call it, uh, uh, term, which was Sid Gomez, who was the Minister of Education, and there was um, Christovan Buarque, many of the Aldo Lima, many of the other policymakers, both in, you know, from the Congress and administration. And that initiative was, and they discussed formative issues in primary education and how research uh, can address that. So how can we bring that back on track, especially in this, with this new, um, this new administration that's going to enter. So, and, and I'm going to introduce what I have to say by, by saying, I, I said at the outset that I'm familiar with some areas of education much more than others. And this is one where I, where I have no special expertise, so, so I can engage in conversation about it, but not, I won't claim uh, to know. I know what, what my colleagues do uh, in ed education schools, when they think about literacy, they think about literacy as, uh, as, or literacy instruction as a set of techniques that lead to the acquisition of a set of skills, right? So this is, this is, this is basically a part of child development. It is a s sort of set of teaching strategies that ensure that children are able to read. And then what they read, you know, and whether they become critical readers is, is somebody else's business. I mean, it, it's it's left for later in the process, and you know, becomes becomes a problem later. So, um, so so I I'm, I'm not sure. How, I, I honestly don't have a good answer to your question, but maybe you can. No, can I, I just push that was maybe, oh, I'm sorry. That w that was maybe probably an old paradigm about mm -hmm. literacy, but I think now there's increasing evidence that literacy is not just the acquisition of a set of skills. But there's an, there's an important component of general knowledge and understanding in creating in in, in creating literacy. Literacy. I, it, I, I would I would just make a point that there's a debate on that that issue. Oh yeah, no and well and 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 yes. What do, what you read, like whether you have things to read first of all, and then what you read, you know, certainly determines whether you're able to remain literate and how you use your literacy. But but yeah, no. I, 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 that, to my knowledge at least, is not an explicit topic of conversation in the U.S. All right. Well, thank you very much to our panelists and uh, to everybody for um, your participation. And we will now break for lunch and reconvene at 1.30. Mm -hmm.